first paper we're going to have is by Agnieszka Nitsa from uh, Warsaw. Um, it's entitled, Can the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Help Beijing Win Pakistani's Hearts and Minds? Reviewing Chinese Soft Power and Pakistan. Um, Agnieszka is based in Warsaw. Uh, in, she's an assistant professor of Asian studies in the Collegian Civitas. Um, she um, studied at Nottingham Trent University and did a PhD on political conditions of democracy in India and Pakistan. Our second paper is going to be by Celine um, Susathian from the Leo Center of European Research and Administration that concerns the Indian quest for honor in the international order, Indian leadership influenced by the Ramayana. And then our third paper is entitled South Asia 2.0 or the end of South Asia as you know it by Christian Wagner from the German Institute for International Security Affairs, uh, where he is a senior um, fellow. So very topical um, panel, very topical papers, and in many ways kind of intrinsically questioning what is South Asia, uh, which is a good thing for us to have at this conference. Hopefully it won't completely rewrite what South Asia is because that will be the end of our nice an acronym for the uh, whole organization, um, but let's see. On top of that, we also have two um, discussants who are delighted to be able to be here and uh, able to contribute. We're heavily um, indebted to them. First of all, there's Tino um, Xavier from um, Brookings, India, uh, where he focuses on regional connectivity and also on decision making, security, democracy, and history within the region. Um, just as a note, Tino is going to be the discussant for the first and the last papers, um, so the one by Agnieszka and the one by Christian. And then we also have a secondary um, discussant, which is Christian himself, who will be discussing um, Celine's paper, um, the one which was going to be delivered yesterday, but for technical reasons is being um, delivered today. Apart from that, just a few housekeeping things. Um, please mute yourself if you're not presenting. Um, we're gonna have 50 minutes presentation for each presenter. Um, I will warn each of you after 10 minutes that you have five minutes left. Um, after that, we'll have 15 minutes from the discussants together. So probably be 10 minutes from Tino, five minutes from Christian. And then that will lead into the um, Q&A. During the Q&A, I ask that you either raise your hand physically or electronically, or you can put a question in the chat and I will uh, manage it, um, so on and so forth. Um, so Agnieszka, um, over to you, please. Okay, uh, I've got a uh, PowerPoint presentation, so I will share my screen with you, just a sec. Okay. It's happening, hopefully. Uh, can you see my presentation? Great, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to present my research that is at its row and initial stage. So today I will address the question, can the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor help Beijing win Pakistan hearts and minds? And to approach it, I will review um, Chinese uh, soft power strategies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan. CPEC lies at uh, the heart of any debate about Pakistan and South Asia, so there is no need to introduce the project uh, to you. Uh, to address the main question of my uh, presentation, at the very beginning, really briefly, uh, I will outline the core characteristics of Chinese soft power, uh, and then I will uh, highlight how uh, these Chinese strategies uh, manifest uh, themselves in the context of Pakistan and the CPEC. Um, you will notice easily that some of these strategies are less soft than the others. Well, and there are some that are not uh, soft at all. Um, I will not go deep into Naya's initial conceptualization. Nevertheless, I would like us uh, just to remember the, the scheme. Um, Naya uh, distinguish sources of soft power, referees or channels of soft power, and uh, receivers. And I will apply this scheme uh, to my uh, research. Uh, when it comes to China's uh, soft power, 
many academics uh, try to adjust Naya's scheme to how uh, China uh, applies its uh, soft power strategies. And for instance, the attempt to extend the three uh, resource uh, model of Naya with, with some extras uh, such as economic development model and international image. The first paper about China's soft power was published uh, in 1993 and since then the culture was presented as the main key source of China's soft power. Uh, while presenting China's soft power to the largest possible extent, I'll try to contextualize it to fit the topic of my uh, presentation. So when it comes to uh, culture, uh, there are some values that are deeply rooted in uh, Chinese traditional cult culture, such as giving priority to human beings and harmony between nature and humankind. Uh, that as some uh, Chinese policymakers and academics uh, claim, uh, offer and approaches to these days problems. And if you look at the narrative around the uh, Belt uh, and Road Initiative, uh, including the CPAC, uh, you will see the echo of these uh, values. Uh, while discussing China's culture as a source of its soft power, we should begin with, with uh, language that is uh, taught by, among others, a Confucius Institute. To emphasize how their network has expanded, I will just provide you with the numbers. Uh, since the first two were launched uh, in Seoul and Tashkent uh, in 2004, uh, the number has grown uh, up to 500 uh, 48. Uh, when it uh, comes to political values as a uh, source of China's soft power, and that's a, a, a tricky one, um, because when uh, the concept of soft power was launched by Naya uh, in 1990, we were in the totally different geopolitical uh, circumstances. Uh, back then, uh, in 1990, the US was the premier enter Paris uh, among uh, soft uh, powers. So the only political values that could be recognized as sources of soft power were the values that were linked uh, with, with the West, uh, with democracy and liberal uh, order. Uh, how Chinese policymakers and academics uh, escape such a uh, perspective. On the one hand, uh, they claim that there is distinction between uh, domestic political values and the values that China projects outside of uh, the country. On the other hand, uh, some claim that democracy is a target of China, but there is long way to go, and they do not want to uh, apply such solutions as shock therapy because they consider it harmful to its uh, people. Uh, the sources of soft power overlap themselves, so I will not discuss all of them. What is worth emphasizing here is that uh, while projecting its foreign policy development model, China, contrary to the uh, EU and the US, it does not touch any political strings. So it does not say you have to be democratic, authoritarian, uh, or whatever to join the Belt and Road Initiative. Like uh, we are inclusive and uh, everyone uh, can join. Uh, in terms of international image and in the context of Pakistan, I will present how China attempts to shape its image via higher education policies and practices. And here we are in Pakistan, in Islamabad, in Saitpur village, that's the picture that I made in 2017. Um, it is one of the uh, manifestations of all whether China, uh, Pakistan, a friendship that encouraged me uh, to investigate the topic of China's soft power vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Pakistan. Uh, when it comes to CPEC as a policy or set of policies that serves 
uh, as a channel, as a source of China's uh, so, soft power, I would like to discuss uh, such channels as um, NGOs and think tanks, Pakistani media, uh, government, central government and provisional uh, government and Pakistani public. Uh, to begin with NGO and think tanks, uh, the, the, uh, we could observe the rise of such or, uh, of, of them um, after the launch of the CPEG, but we should, we should remember that uh, most of them is founded by Islamabad or Benjin, and they project a particular uh, enthusiastic narrative uh, about the CPEC. When it comes to media, uh, recently Siegfried Wolf published a paper about how uh, Beijing tries to control uh, Pakistani media. And uh, for instance, uh, the Rapid Response Information Exchange Network uh, was launched in 2018. Uh, to counter CPEC's criticism uh, coming from international and naturally uh, Indian uh, media. So as, as we can see, like these this practices uh, cannot be uh, recognized as uh, soft. Uh, well, when we look at uh, Pakistan's government and how they talk about China, how they approach China, there is no doubt uh, that China won the hearts of minds of central government and security uh, establishment. It is not so easy for China with provisional uh, governments. Uh, ironically, uh, while ruling Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Imran Khan himself uh, was questioning the game changer uh, potential of uh, the CPAC. Well, he changed his mind uh, after becoming uh, the Prime uh, Minister. Uh, when, uh, when we look uh, at Pakistani pu uh, publics, uh, we can observe that they are rather positive about the CPEC, and here we've got a survey conducted by uh, Gallup. And nevertheless, the survey has not been broken down by the province, as Adne and Bani noticed. So, in fact, we, we do not know if people in Balochistan, Khyber Pashtunkhwa, uh, like the CPEC to the same extent uh, as a uh, population of uh, Punjab. Uh, there are some manifestations of uh, discontent um, to be uh, recognized uh, in Pakistan and outside of the country. Uh, and for instance, in Gilgit Baltistan, uh, people uh, protest, protested not, I would say, against the CPEC, but for the CPEC. They wanted more. Uh, from uh, the CPEC. So uh, for me, it's a proof that Chinese um, are successful in uh, projecting the CPEC as an investment that is a source of benefits uh, and uh, profits. Um, when it comes to Chinese uh, culture, uh, after the launch of, uh, of the CPEC, the number of Confucius Institutes in Pakistan has uh, re risen from uh, one uh, to four. And next to them, there are other language schools uh, mushrooming. What's more, a Pakistani may learn uh, Chinese from a radio channel. The rise of a Chinese language school has responded to the growing demand from Pakistani uh, society. Uh, in 2018, 25,000 Pakistani were uh, learning uh, Chinese. And here again, we do not have data uh, from the province. So for me, it's interesting if people from uh, Baluchistan, Gil uh, Gilgit Baltistan, um, that are provinces that are, that are more skeptic vis-a-vis -vis CPEC uh, than the others are willing to study uh, Chinese the same as people in uh, Punjab. Uh, interestingly, some of these Chinese classes are founded by Benjin uh, and uh, Islamabad. And here an interesting manifestation how China uh, tries to associate itself uh, with democracy. Uh, that's the picture that was made in uh, Islamabad. It's a 
plastic bottle that uh, produced by a Chinese company. And it says, if you cannot see it, uh, my dream, the, the Chinese dream, powerful democracy, civilization, uh, harmonious. Uh, I do not know how many and how different manifesta such manifestations are there uh, in Pakistan, but regardless of that, China seems successful uh, because 75% of Pakistani identifies China as at least uh, somewhat uh, democratic. And at the end, that's the, the last slide, I promise, um, uh, you can see um, how China uh, applies higher education policies and practices, uh, in my opinion, to improve its uh, international image. Uh, so uh, the number of uh, Pakistani students studying in China has uh, grown dramatically since the launch of the CPAC uh, from 5,000 in 2012 uh, to 28,000 in uh, 2018. Uh, some of uh, them are founded by China, uh, Chinese uh, scholarship. What's more, uh, China uh, establishes uh, regional academic networks as, for instance, the University Alliance of the Silk Road. Uh, interestingly, only one Pakistani university uh, has joined it. There are also centers for collaborative research established at Pakistani universities, for instance, at LAMS and at the University of the Punjab in Lahore. And last remark, which is, uh, which is interesting for, for us uh, uh, social and political uh, scientists, uh, China and Pakistan plans uh, to, uh, to, uh, to launch joint academy of social science in, uh, in Pakistan uh, based on the model of the Chinese Academy of Social Science. Um, there is no time for, uh, for conclusion, so I believe that Q&A session may uh, serve um, as such. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for that very interesting paper. Uh, and excellent time management as well. That was very impressive. Um, so, Celine, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much for this great opportunity uh, to present my paper. Uh, unfortunately, yesterday, you know what happened. Uh, I struggled with the, the internet connection. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, present this paper. It is a very uh, draft uh, initial uh, at, a, at a very initial stage, um, but I will be very happy to share uh, a few hypotheses with you. And if you have any questions, you can, uh, you can ask. Um, so um, this is all about the way uh, a great epic such as Ramayana, <clears throat> maybe some or most of you, you have heard about that, the way the Ramayana has uh, and the Mahabharata have influenced uh, nowadays contemporary uh, Indian political leaders. Uh, so I'm going to start with this uh, introductive uh, part, uh, art and war uh, in Asia, especially in South Asia, have a special and very close relationship, especially in India. Uh, heroes are often portrayed uh, in legendary frescoes through music and dance movies. Uh, the stories of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana trace uh, the heroic facts of certain gods and semi-gods. Uh, let's compare with the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, you know, in the Greek uh, traditions. Uh, likewise, current, uh, you know, nowadays Indian movies also tell the story of uh, ordinary men uh, who ultimately turn out to be superheroes. Uh, the, those people defend the interest of the nation vis-a-vis -vis the criminals, uh, the traitors, or even uh, foreigners, okay, uh, who have come to, cr to create or to nurture chaos uh, in the country. Uh, so this is the way, you know, some uh, filmmakers uh, try to uh, send a message uh, to the audience and uh, the way, you know, those people are supposed to uh, defend, to save uh, their interest against any uh, third actor's uh, interference, influence. Uh, so the glory linked uh, to the battlefield here, and especially in the Ramayana, and this is what uh, are 
what we really want to describe, uh, the glory link to the battlefield seems very significant uh, in the evocation of the uh, the world uh, war. Okay, societies, those societies uh, have a great idea of the glory of combat fighting. Um, there is glory. There is a honor credibility okay uh, why uh, defending your your honor you have to go uh, to the combat uh, get, uh, to the battleground uh, what is essential here is to understand the notion of sacrifice sacrifice of the individual uh, sacrifice of the community okay to whom the individual uh, belongs uh, and this is the way uh, you know uh, it's celebrated uh, by others and especially by poets, bars, uh, rather than the, the process, uh, you know, the phenomenon of war itself. And we can see that uh, in the Ramayana. This exaltation of violence that takes place in the context of a conflict for the victory of good uh, over evil is often part uh, of a quest for honor for the hero. Uh, those ancient literatures provide intelligent uh, interpretation and even reinterpretation uh, to apply effectively uh, in our nowadays contemporary uh, context of leadership. And something very uh, important to know, and I'm pretty sure that all of you already know about that, uh, but the Ramayanas is in fact well known to vast audiences in India, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, etc. Uh, Indian concepts of leadership have been exemplified by the heroes, uh, and as I told you, I, I just gave that quick, very fast, uh, that quick example of, you know, uh, current movies. Huh? Those movies are uh, watched by so many people uh, all over the world. Um, you, you know that there is a lot of uh, Indian, you know, that there are lots of Indians and the Indian diaspora or those who are uh, very close to that culture and civilization huh? uh, all over the world. So, um, that concept of leadership, that concept of, you know, um, the quest for honor, glory, etc., uh, are very well understood by uh, many people uh, all over the world. And people, especially political leaders, because there's a collusion uh, between, you know, those top, le top leaders and uh, the people, um, people and especially political leaders, such as Indian prime ministers uh, in our contemporary era, uh, have developed their own powerful traditions of the Ramayana, and other countries have done the same. Uh, let's think about the Javanese, Cambodian, Thai versions, for, ex for instance, um, you know, and in the way uh, Ramayana, the Ramayana was uh, incorporated uh, uh, into those cultures uh, through oral textual forms nurturing narrative, visual, musical representations. Huh? Let's think about uh, songs, dance, drama, architecture, okay? Um, and this is very important because those performance forms were deeply rooted uh, in the original uh, Indian narrative, but their flawed characters were altered to fit the literary and artistic traditions of the Thai, uh, Khmer, uh, Indonesian, uh, cultures uh, and so on and so forth. So here, in relation to uh, nowadays, uh, you know, the, the the role played by India uh, in the region in South Asia and even vis-à-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world, uh, we can be uh, highly uh, surprised by how you know the Ramayana has a great influence on the cognitive uh, mindset and the cognitive map uh, of those leaders. And I will focus on one key uh, political leader, uh, and it will be uh, easier for me to do that and easier for you to understand in a very short uh, time framework. Huh? I will focus on Narendra Modi, uh, I guess, uh, Narendra Modi and the BJP uh, in a few minutes. Um, collectively, you know, uh, those, uh, you know, uh, the, the way those epics, uh, they tried, you know, the, 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 the poets, uh, and especially Valmiki, huh? he's the one uh, who is believed uh, to, 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 you know, who, who has uh, who wrote uh, that great epic? Uh, 
the message given by that epic has been incorporated by many uh, many Indians. I, I, I believe so. Uh, I guess, um, and they established a discourse, discourse that taught, taught most of the Indians who they were. Uh, for example, in classical times, the sign of an educated man was his ability to recite sections of the Ramayana and even the Mahabharata, and they were those people who know both epics by uh, heart. Even nowadays, uh, very important and true, uh, many Indians have assimilated the great epics epic values to such a degree, as I told you, uh, through film movies, uh, in schools, etc. Uh, and they should, uh, the, sorry, some of them, they should mold their lives uh, around the characters and values of the epics. So this is not really a big surprise uh, if the BJP, especially, and uh, Nandra Modi have, especially nowadays, huh, since, um, you know, his first uh, appearance, huh? uh, you know, as the, 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 the prime minister, uh, they have, you know, created that grand narrative, uh, you know, uh, and the way India and those Indian political leaders, they should play, you know, a very uh, important, prevalent role uh, in the world. So the Ramayana is not only considered as a fictional work that describes a fictional you know, uh, in fictional world, yeah, but it's also accepted by some people as part of uh, the sacred and the former existing world. And in that case, you know, in that configuration, uh, the Ramana has shaped not only the collective memory of gener generations of uh, Indians uh, and South and Southeast Asians, but also uh, the institutional memory. And this is why uh, you know, it was so easy for Narendra Modi to be heard um, and to be uh, respected uh, by so many people, even nowadays uh, in India. You know, even if you know that party was highly criticized for the actions against other communities, other minorities uh, in India. Uh, but the way, you know, uh, Modi, uh, especially the PM, the, the, that Indian uh, prime minister has shaped or reshaped with the help of the BJP, um, the, the, the way, you know, they have uh, built and shaped uh, the history, you know, of nowadays India to the rest of South Asia and to the rest of the, 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 the world, it's uh, highly uh, important to understand. And here, um, uh, yes, okay, the myth of the Ramayana here, um, in relation to uh, the way Narendra Modi and the BJP have uh, built and shaped, uh, you know, uh, the role played by India. Uh, I'm going to focus on a few projects huh, here. Uh, the myth of the Ramayana, for example, um, has influenced uh, Modi uh, and so many other um, prime ministers in the past, but Nowadays, this is very striking, this is very, um, you know, uh, clear, the way uh, Modi has, uh, you know, interacted with others, uh, the way, you know, uh, he tried to, uh, to show, you know, that Manichaean vision of the hero fighting an enemy, uh, you know, he, the, the, that creative peak in Ramayana especially, has shaped the cognitive and mental map and the, the interpersonal relationship from you know, one key leader to the rest of the world. And many have spoken of Narendra Modi's interest in, in transitions, sorry, even his obsession with his competitors, and his in, trans, in transitions is to be with his sense of honor, at least as, you know, at least the way he perceived it. Huh? Here, I'm going to just to, um, to quote a citation um, from, uh, you know, uh, myself, I'm sorry, uh, you know, uh, there has been through the course of the last four years an attempt to craft for India what in historical terms is often called a nation's grand narrative. And here you have several uh, papers you can find out on Google, huh? uh, through Google or at the library, you know, primary sources, uh, secondary hands sources, etc. Um, the Sagar Mala project, for example, uh, in India, carrying goods quickly to and from ports since 2015. Uh, the Bharat Mala project linking India's vast west to east land from Gujarat to Mizoram. Another project uh, conducted by Narendra Modi and the BJP. Uh, the Mumbai Trans Harbour Link, supposed to be the longest uh, sea bridge. Uh, and uh, last example, uh, 
you know, here you can see the competition between um, Modi and uh, some neighboring countries, okay, because there is a rivalry and this is not really new, uh, you know, when we refer to India, but under the BJP and under Modi, for example, uh, that was the idea of, uh, you know, uh, investing in a project, uh, for example, uh, the tallest bridge in the world over the river Chenab. Uh, at Dodo, uh, for example, 359, uh, 359 meters above the river, and uh, it, it is supposed to surpass the current record held by Big Pan River Shubai uh, Railway Bridge, <coughs> which is 257 meters in Guizhou province of China. So here you have a few uh, examples uh, of the projects conducted by uh, Modi and the, the, the BJP. Uh, and Modi himself declared officially uh, in an interview um, that he was influenced by myths, uh, you know, those great epics, and more specifically by the tales, uh, epic tales contained in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Uh, he sounds uh, very passionate about those epics and heroic tales in relation to India's identity and grand narrative he tried to shape, okay? Um, and uh, here, Modi belongs to the BJP and the Bharatiya Janata Party, whose social political vision is inspired by its parent organization and the Hindu militant group, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, RSS, okay, and since its inception about almost a century ago, um, all, of, all of us, we already know about that, and the RSS has tried to demonize uh, yes, to alien Muslims and Christians uh, in India, huh? uh, but according to that great ground narrative, uh, the way uh, you know Modi and those uh, you know political leaders of the BJP and those who are also working with that RSS, they try to uh, create you know um, a sort of you know new uh, new identity for India, you know trying to build on that. Uh, build on those traditions. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, end here. And if you have any questions in relation to the paper, I would be uh, very happy to uh, to share my comments and yes, to, to continue the discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celine. Very interesting paper as well. And I think really building on the first one, actually, in lots of different ways, narratives, ideas, soft power kind of in different ways. Um, so over to our last presenter, um, Christian Wagner. Thank you. So well, um, this is an on, this is uh, work from ongoing. Um, it, it's an ongoing project which I started some years ago. I've published some smaller papers, and um, uh, the idea came from different developments that I observed in the region, and which I then started to somehow try to bring together. And the outcome was this idea: what I, what changes we may see in our understanding of South Asia. What I'm doing in the paper here is just to uh, look at four points. First, I will give a short introduction into the development of the regional denomination in early times to, uh, un, uh, until the end of the colonial period. Then the second part deals a little bit with what I call the birth of South, South Asia. Uh, I look at external drivers, um, at internal drivers, and then, of course, I have found out that I have to answer for myself, what is South Asia? So what do we understand normally um, when we discuss um, when we discuss the region? No, sorry. Sorry. No, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> Go back. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, then the third part looks at the changing character. So what are the drivers for, for change? Where I do, where I take the point to see uh, to argue that we may see some developments going on both outside the region, which, which have a strong impact on the region, within the region, but also then on the, uh, on the national level. And then finally, look a little bit at the prospect of what I would call South Asia 2.0. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when you look at the um, development of the concept of, of South Asia, it's interesting. There is a lot of debate um, on these things uh, in other disciplines. Um, what I found quite interesting, which I put here as a short summary, when, when you look at um, 
at 1947, there were very different concepts on how the region should should uh, should be labeled. There was the idea of Bharat by Hindu nationalists. There was the idea of India, Al Hind or Hindustan. So there were very different concepts on how the whole region could be described. Then the second part is a little bit more interesting when you look at the creation of, of South Asia. I think we can all agree um, that probably the idea or the concept of the region or this landmass to be regarded as a region was mainly put forward probably by external drivers. So it was mostly foreign policy issues and the development of area studies in the United States, which gave a major push. I've, this has already been studied by American and Indian colleagues, and I, you can go back to a lot of literature um, on, this de, uh, on this development when you look at area studies in the US. So it was mainly, let's say, external drivers, which somehow made it necessary um, to look at this complex region in a more comprehensive way. From the internal development, regionalism came only very late um, in South Asia. Uh, Arndt has written a lot on, on these uh, issues. You had a Colombo plan in 51, yes, but there was hardly ever a real push um, until SAIG was established in uh, 1985. Even when, when you go through some of the um, speeches of Nehru and um, there are um, on his speeches on foreign policy, it's interesting to see um, that he, he, even he does not have an idea of South Asia. He talked of the neighborhood, he talked of Asian solidarity, yes, but South Asia, let's say the region or the neighboring countries together as a region has not really focused to a great extent um, in, uh, in his uh, writings. Then of course comes the tricky part, what is South Asia? I mean, the problem here and the problem which I have to struggle all the time um, is that, um, that South Asia means different things to different people in different disciplines, okay? So, I mean, we are an interdisciplinary group here and maybe um, some of you have a very different background. I'm a political scientist, so I look forward to get also your views. When you ask the question, you have what constitutes South Asia, you have to keep in mind these differences. For political scientists, uh, when you look at the region, it's mostly about the India-Pakistan relationship. You can do the test, you go into your bookshelf, you take out a book on South, with South Asia in the title, and it's most likely to cover India-Pakistan relations to a great extent. The second part is also from, let's say, the economic side or social, uh, uh, the social economic challenges that is facing the region. Region is known, everybody knows, um, of having uh, enormous social economic problems in all the countries. So unfortunately, when you look at these first two points, it's a more negative picture um, of what we normally have in the international arena uh, on this part of the world. Then, of course, you have, and this is a great, uh, a long debate, especially in humanities, um, about cultural diversity. I mean, we all know unity in diversity, and this is a debate which is often and very much pronounced in, um, in, uh, in um, uh, humanities, that the region, or the core of the region, is the cultural diversity. Of course, this is a very ambivalent kind of idea, because you can then ask, hmm, if you have Uni if you have diversity, where do you get the common feeling? Is it then just the cultural diversity? So it's a little bit of tricky debate. Um, you also have concepts which were developed by KM Dixit on South Asia together in one word, which somehow tries to grab the idea that South Asia or being South, South Asian as is, um, as is his approach has more to do with a common, with the empathy you have for the region. You're from the region, you feel yourself attached to the region as a citizen uh, of one of the, um, of one of those countries. So it's a very mixed picture in most, in our, in social science, it's mostly a very critical, a very negative picture uh, in humanities. It's a little bit more positive, but of course also having a different focus. Next slide, please, Nicolas. Thank you. So what is the change and where do I see the changes coming from which are going to have an impact uh, on this part of the world? First, again, I would say it's a 
it's a it's a global factor. I mean, when I when you make the point, the region was created mainly by external developments. You could continue saying, well, the change is also coming by external developments, and I see here the biggest impact of the Belt and Road initiatives. It's not necessary to go into the details. You are all familiar with them. Um, where do I see the challenge? The challenge is that. Um, BRI may have, will of course foster economic relations between China and the uh, uh, respected countries. The problem is, will it, what will be the long-term impact on the idea of regional cooperation in the economic sense? Um, so we may see a restructuring of economic relations, which have never been good in the region, but with the strong impact of BRI, I do not see that they are going to become better. So in that sense, BRI, it's not often discussed, but I think BRI is also an interesting um, project because it's also an attack on regional cooperation, which is important for policy making, for instance, in Germany, as Germans have always put a great, um, great hope and a great interest in fostering regional cooperation projects. SAIC has never been very successful. This is, this is all well, well known, but I think uh, it's going to become even weaker um, because of the strong impact, especially the economic impact um, that China uh, gives with the Belt and Road Initiative. The second point is uh, what I would call the decoupling of India-Pakistan relations. I, since 2017, I write in my pieces on India-Pakistan, I write about the, more the decoupling rather than the rapprochement. I think um, 2016 is probably the watershed year, especially after the Uri attack in September. Um, since then, we have seen all these new um, um, initiatives or revitalization by the Indian government. Constantino has also written on this quite extensively um, for new forms of sub-regional cooperation, be it the BIMSTEC, the BDIM, the BCIM, or tri trilateral. Um, um, initiatives between India, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. So even on the regional dimension, my point would be our understanding, and when you go to your bookshelf and you look at former books on South Asia, and I said it's most about India, Pakistan, I wonder whether that's, this bilateral relationship will have the same importance in a couple of years. Uh, we have seen it recently with the um, um, with the decision of the Indian government on Kashmir last year that even the Pakistani government uh, stopped all attempts uh, officially to even talk to the Indians uh, about any um, rapprochement. Finally, what is what I've added here, and I thought a little bit about it, and I'm not quite sure. Um, when you look at the rise of nationalism, um, the interesting thing is that religion and is and especially religious nationalism also is a certain attack uh, on cultural diversity at the end of the day. Um, we see this in different countries at the moment. There is this tendency to make India first, to make Pakistan first, make a new Pakistan, a new India. We will see, or we have seen it in um, Sri Lanka as well that the idea of cultural diversity, which has always been very strong, may come increasingly under pressure um, in, this whole in this whole debate um, about nationalism. So, how, so the understanding, especially in humanities, that the region is um, shaped by the cultural diversity. I wonder whether that's another point which will be valid in, let's say, 10 to 20 years, or we may see tendencies um, that this cultural diversity is slowly being um, put on the uh, back burner and um, replaced by greater forms of uh, cultural um, hom uh, homogeneity. So where will this leave us? Prospect South Asia 2.0. I, I think, of course, and this is why I can assure you, uh, we can continue to work on this part of the uh, world. Um, that's not the point. But I think we may see new forms of regionalism. And so I, I wouldn't do this if I phrased it South Asia 2.0. Um, we may see new forms of connectivity. Yes, we may probably see a region which is much more connected on a, what we would call a sub-regional level. Yes. 
But this, of course, would be a change because normally our understanding is we somehow, and when you look at your own uh, symbol for the institution, you have all the eight countries which form side um, are part of the um, part of the uh, symbol. I wonder in how far this is a valid construction 10 to 20 years down the line for the simple reason that we may see new forms of uh, connectivity. So we will not see this kind of regionalism, which has always been weak, we saw in recent years, but will be replaced. It may also, lo or may also lo lose its importance. Um, so we may see new forms of connectivity, but probably without the idea of regionalism, which has also shaped um, the understanding of the region. So with this, I would like to end and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Nicolas, thanks for the turning. Great, thank you very much, Christian. Um, I think lots of things there to think about, particularly in terms of how ideas change, values change, impact of different um, influences in different ways. So we're now gonna have our comments from our two discussants. Um, perhaps we could do it one paper at a time, um, and then a, a reaction from the presenter and then use that as a springboard for the discussion. So, um, Tino, over to you first with the first paper. So, hi everyone, uh, hello from Delhi. Uh, hope you're all well and very nice to see you all and uh, to have uh, this initiative. So congrats to you, Chris, and to the four other members of this wonderful initiative. Uh, and you've really you know, held it up even despite this whole crisis and made us come here virtually together. So that's really nice and thanks for doing that. Um, uh, Chris, you've asked me to condense my comments into five to seven minutes for both papers. You want me to do both papers now, only one? Sorry. Um, I, I didn't... It's up to you actually, if you want to do both together, it's fine. Okay, yeah. so I'll start with uh, uh, Agnieszka, so I'll go right into it and really try to make my best in uh, bringing this together and just give a few ideas of, um, um, on uh, the paper and a few suggestions on uh, further improving the papers as I assume these are drafts and you're working on them. Uh, Agnieszka, I really enjoyed your paper. It's uh, for two reasons. I think the first one is you pushing us to think about connectivity uh, on the softer dimension. Uh, we tend to think about connectivity and Chinese investments in particular on economics, on security, on military dimensions and you really push us into the sort of cultural immaterial dimension of connectivity. That's a neglected area of research because China itself is a neg neglected actor uh, of study in South Asia. Um, and you bring those two dimensions together really nicely. And second, I think you're onto something because you're really developing this alternative typology towards soft power. Um, I think you're trying to really develop um, beyond what was and has been a Western dominated US centric uh, debate on soft power, also historical Cold War focused debate on soft power and then a post-Cold War, if you want reinvention of that uh, as the term soft power uh, comes up uh, post nineties, but you're really now pushing it into different geographical and different systemic, political systemic uh, uh, analysis because China, as you rightly point out, is a different type of actor and that allows us to um, look at soft power differently. So I'll go to just three claims you make in the paper and just try to point to maybe a few uh, leads you could uh, take on. The first one is this idea that Chinese soft power, is it really soft and is it good or bad, right? I'll quote from your uh, paper at one point, you say there's a question whether Pakistani hearts and minds were won by the Chinese in a fair play as assumed in Nye's soft power initial conceptualization or if they were hijacked. Um, and I think, you know, again, you mentioned the Chinese soft power is really not really uh, reflective of the Western approach of soft powers as focused on democracy, liberalism, and you say ultimately the spread of Western values. So is that really the case? That is a question. And I'd say yes, probably I would agree with you. In fact, if you may want to look at this sort of reinvention of soft power now, or at least, sorry, the, the attempt to look at soft power from inventing a new concept that explains what you are looking at, which is what these, uh, you know, new scholars have been doing and some think tanks talking about Americans, sharp, uh, sorry, about Chinese sharp power, right? I think that reflects what you're trying to say, that soft power 
is something that you know many Westerners and scholars and policymakers are not happy to use when describing Chinese approaches, and therefore they've invented this new concept of sharp power. So that may be useful, but also reminds me of this debate we've had in constructivism and IR theory about good or bad norms. Uh, you know, and I think I think we all come to the conclusion there are no there's no such thing as good bad norms. That's an ethical debate. We can have that, but in terms of the analysis, it really doesn't help. Um, but you may want to look at that too, and I think it should be interesting to look at um, soft power from those two angles. The second claim you make uh, is at the heart of your paper, which is really looking at China and soft power as a strategy in Pakistan. You know, here I think two quick tips. If you could maybe look at, you know, you actually look at, you speak about, you, 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 in your paper you pack probably 10 case studies together, right? You speak about NGOs and think tanks, the media central and local governments, the public. Then you go to the case studies of Confucius Institutes, the film industry, the political values and influence, and higher education. You know, I think it, your paper would benefit because in all of them you make important uh, suggestions, but maybe choosing a few of these, uh, at least from you know, these sort of eight to 10, maybe down to two or three, would, be, uh, would help you to go in depth and uh, look at that because that's what really we need i think in the current scholarship we have these this anecdotal evidence you know we come across every day uh, but we we haven't seen really good studies of someone spending some time and understanding how have the chinese really influenced pakistani media uh, or in nepal are the chinese really you know supporting and influencing political parties now in nepal we see a lot of that, but it's still work in progress, and it would be wonderful if we had some solid research on one, two, or three case studies. Um, and also, if you clarify it, I think it's a very interesting concept, referee and receiver. You mentioned that, but if you could clarify that, that would be also interesting. What you mean by referee, I think you mean like channels probably and audiences, but at the beginning of that section would be useful to clarify that. And finally, the last uh, suggestion I only have is you know, to what extent does history help us to understand this debate in Pakistan today and the Cold War history in particular? I don't know much about, you know, Pakistan and, and, and uh, 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 what's happening in, in this field. But I'm thinking in India, for example, you have very interesting literature now on the Cold War strategies of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. For example, David Engerman's work on price of aid and the whole debates about soft power and aid and economic diplomacy. I think it'd be interesting if you look a bit about the past and see how has Pakistan traditionally dealt with external actors trying to shape hearts and minds. And the second was just three key authors I was thinking of who've done some work on this, who could be interesting. Uh, one is Simbal Khan. I saw a nice presentation of hers last year, uh, similar to what you were saying about also the pushback now in Pakistan on Chinese uh, uh, influence. Another scholar is Maria Bashtush. She was at ISA last year. I can share the contacts with you if you don't touch, but she's also very, very, very interesting work on connectivity and how the Chinese are trying to shape the, also the idea of connectivity in Pakistan. Uh, and finally, of course, Andrew Small, who's done a lot of recent work, more policy-ish, but could be interesting in terms of the actual, you know, since it's all very fresh, of how the Chinese are influencing um, uh, Pakistani debates and perceptions. Okay, I'll push back, uh, onwards to uh, Christian's uh, paper. Christian, um, a great paper which really lays out the concept of South Asia, uh, how it is changing according to new developments, global, national, region. And I think you're really trying to see how the idea of the region is coming under stress given these changes. And I mean, many changes happening uh, um, as we speak, really. Um, the first suggestion I have, Christian, really is uh, you spend you know some time clarifying you know this concept of South Asia, and as you rightly pointed out, even now in your presentation, we have a lot of work on that. So your paper will, I think, benefit if you either do a conceptual analysis, a concept tracing paper that's interesting, but, but whatever you call it, South Asia, subcontinent, region, etc. I think your paper really is not doing that. So. It's not, it, it gets trapped in the sort of, is this concept tracing useful or not? Does it help? Has it boxed in the region? But it's, I think, a slightly different debate from what you're trying to do, which is there's a sense of regionness, whatever you want to call it, and how is it reflecting, uh, how is it responding to the changes? So uh, three quick claims. The claim one, number one is that you say that compared to developments in the United States, there was hardly any initiative in South Asia to strengthen regional cooperation post-1947, number one. Number two, you're saying the main push for regionalism 
in South Asia was actually only in the late 70s and 1980s. And then you back it up by saying, for example, Nehru never used the term South Asia. Mm -hmm. But does it really mean that just because he didn't use the term South Asia or just because there was no Sark, that there was no region and sense of regionness? And, you know, in some ways you actually suggest that that's not the case, that you mentioned as, uh, the Colombo plan. I would add, if you look at the recent literature on health cooperation in South Asia in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s under Searo, uh, which was under a larger global initiative, but was really regional cooperation where you had India sharing on traditional medicine, Ayurveda, uh, Unani, for example, also traditional medicines, a lot of creating institutes in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, in Burma. So if you look at health, you actually have a sense of regionness and also a sense of actual regional institutions, not proper organizations, but organized cooperation on health, for example, malaria eradication, uh, uh, measles early on. So there's a lot of interesting work, just as an example. So I would say that actually we cannot get hung on to this idea that regionalism depends on regional organizations, therefore only begins in the 1980s. Uh, second, you know, otherwise you could, if you disagree, you could make the argument Zoravar Dalit Singh makes in his recent book, for example, he says that the concept of the region for Nehru and other people in the region was actually Asia and not South Asia as we think of, right? That's his argument, uh, but that's a debate we can have, but that would be my suggestion. You could either argue one of the two. Claim number two, you say concept of South Asia um, has changed, and you say basically there's three changes, right? Like you mentioned in your presentation. So the first one is you say that the rise of China and the Belt and Road Initiative will, quote, undermine the process of regionalism and further weaken the concept of South Asia, unquote. So I'm not sure about this. I'm a bit torn. I think, yes, on the one hand, you could say that China, which you suggest is disrupting supply chains, trading more with Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, therefore the region is weakening. But on the other hand, you know, frankly, because of China, India is doing more than ever on the region. Second, because of can COVID just, in particular. Yeah. Hello, can you just repeat the last sentence? There was some acoustical problem. Okay. Sorry. So I was saying you could argue, yes, that because of China, there's a disruption of the region, right? That is what you argue. But you could also say that because of China, India is doing more than ever on regionalism, on interdependence. Uh, actually, that's my claim. It's, it, it took China really for India to develop now that language of interdependence, regionist connectivity that it was not performing on for decades, right? That it was literally neglecting. Also, currently, I mean, this paper on the COVID crisis, you see actually that the sense of region is becoming more important again. Uh, so it's been a blessing in disguise, I mean, paradoxically, for the sense of regionness again in South Asia, because India is actually now looking at Again, privileging shorter supply routes, looking at Bangladesh, looking at Sri Lanka, looking at Southeast Asia, if you want to extend South Asia there, but that's changing. Um, and so therefore, I would say that even on institutions, your paper shows that there's been more activity, whether it's BIMSTEC and BBIN, and you know, I'm critical of a lot of these achievements, and they've not been enough, but actually there's been more movement there. So I see some hope in response to China. So paradoxically, the, the rise of China has actually sensed uh, created a bit of more interest uh, and more convergence in the region, uh, including by certain countries, uh, Christian, which paradoxically for 70 years was saying, India, stay away, stay away. We don't want to connect with India. And now because of the hedging strategies are actually saying we want to connect and we want to create greater regional multilateralism and cooperation uh, because we need a balance between China, India, and other actors. Uh, decoupling, I agree with you. But it's not a divorce, right? It's challenging because I would use the word, the word schism. And a schism, as you know, is a process that is hurtful and never really total. It's a debate between two groups that separate. And I see that India and Pakistan, there's a decoupling, but it will not solve. There's a sense of regionist that permeates this, that region. And I mean, you can put it in the freezer, but it will come back. That's my point, right? And it, you can also say it's the end of that region that includes India, Pakistan. You can sort of just look east and look south and India can ignore Pakistan. We saw that on the locusts crisis, right, recently, that you, need, you actually had Prime Minister Modi in the government saying Pakistan is evil, we don't work with them, but then secretly asking Pakistan for cooperation on sharing mm -hmm. information, etc. So you cannot deny that. A third, the national argument you make, the most interesting in terms of, you know, the idea of South Asia as a cultural entity, this whole Hindutva business, 
both, I would say again, for both, both effects. On one, you could say, yes, Hindutva and the language, as I have argued, has been detrimental. You don't want to speak about commonness, similarity with your neighbors, right? Because you will upset Nepalis, Sri Lankans, Bangladeshis in particular, who say, we don't want to be common to India, right? We're distinct independent countries. On the other hand, there's also a civilizational argument that often, you know, rings bells in these countries and has constituencies, Mahindra Raja Paksa and Sri Lanka, that enjoy this and make the argument that we have a special relationship with India based on Buddhism, on civilizational links. So it cuts both ways. And I think that deserves a bit more analysis. And finally, I'll end on the, on the last claim, which I think is really interesting, uh, Christian, and I'd like, it's the last chunk. I see you've not continued that. It's just a few paragraphs in your draft, but connectivity without regionalism. So is it what, chaotic connectivity? I would agree that you have India sort of pitching on all levels, bilateral, regional, BBIN, BIMSTEC, SARC, maybe, maybe not, BCIM, should we again play with the Chinese? Though I don't think if that's gonna happen now after May, but you have this chaotic connectivity without that classic, beautiful, and I'm gonna say it very European or very German, organized regional, cooperation initiative like SARC, interorganizational with processes, with charters, etc. But that's not necessarily bad news. You know, I think there's a flexibility in here of looking at many levels. And like you say, there is connectivity and there's a different regionalism now that reflects the urgency, the contingency with which India, but also many other actors and the other neighbors around it look at the importance of, of working out habits of cooperation, you know, that don't hang on to one single organization. I'll end at that. Thank you. Salim, before I start, I have to ask one question. What is your academic background? Um, uh, in political science, I got a PhD in political science. Okay, Internet okay. no, I was asking because I, I was wondering um, whether we may have very different backgrounds and this would have made the debate a little bit more tricky. Um, thank you very much for the draft uh, and for the and for the for the presentation. I think it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting idea, but I've struggled a little bit with the conceptual conceptualization of the paper. Okay, yes. so in the sense, um, even when you make the point that Modi is being influenced by the Ramayana. What's the kind of argument you want to make at the end of the day? That, pol that politicians draw back on their historical legacies. That's common. Okay, our German chancellor does not go back to the Nibelungen. Um, okay, but politicians are free to choose whatever they take out of their cultural heritage or what they um, uh, think it's useful. So in, so in that sense, it was not really clear to me how, how do you want to oper operationalize this idea that the Ramayana has an influence. Yes, you can show that ideas of the Ramayana are reflected in Modi speeches. Yes. Um, but what's the point at the end of, so what's, what's the argument at the end of the day? Do you want to make that Ramayana or the idea, ideas in the Ramayana will become, how to say, a kind of an, of, an, of an ideal for India's future identity in a diverse country like India? Hmm. I would find it interesting, as, as you mentioned, um, that the Ramayana was also picked up by countries in Southeast Asia, like Cam Cambodia and Thailand, okay? So it would be interesting, I think, to, com to compare the different conceptions, for instance, of the Ramayana in, let's say, prime minister's images in those two or three countries. Okay? Yeah. So, so I was, as, as I said, I was struggling mostly with the fact that I, I see it's an interesting topic, yes, but it's not really clear where you want to end up and how you want to get there. Mm. Okay, so maybe we can have a more open debate. And I mean, there has been a lot of literature in India on movie stars becoming prime ministers, movie stars using 
um, these old uh, uh, images of Indian uh, uh, deities uh, to uh, make the images. So in, so in that sense, I think we can open the debate here and we are an interdisciplinary group. So we, you may have more people here from different approaches to somehow help you to somehow make your argument a little bit sharper or give you a better idea where you want to end it, uh, where you want to end up with the project. Because at the moment, this is why I was struggling mostly when I, when I went to, that I found it an interesting topic, yes, but hmm, I'm not really getting the argument and I find it difficult for you to somehow get there. So I just leave it at this and have more time for the debate. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, would any of today's presenters like to reply directly to the to the feedback, the thoughts, and the discussants? Or yeah, or yeah, I can I any? can briefly uh, do it. So so thank you very much for for that uh, valuable uh, feedback. That's something at the beginning um, of uh, of the research. Uh, so. Uh, is Chinese soft power good or bad? Well, no, I have no answer. Like even Naya said that soft power uh, is neither good nor bad. So like we do not uh, know. Also, I was thinking of introducing the concept of sharp power but I thought that it would be the next stage and maybe now I'm at this stage and I should uh, do it. Uh, too many cases, uh, totally agree, but I have just realized that uh, while writing the paper and preparing this presentation. So for sure, I need to uh, select some uh, particular ones, but the selection would depend uh, on the data availability, because um, it's, it's really hard to find data, especially quantitative data about China's uh, uh, Chinese performance in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, well, uh, and when it comes to um, uh, Pakistan and external uh, actors uh, and their attempts to win hearts and minds of uh, Pakistani publics and uh, government. Well, since Pakistan inception, as Jafra Law uh, wrote, Pakistan had to look for uh, friends to buy weapon uh, from, and these friends were the US and China. But um, what's happening now? Now, pa people in Pakistan, they, they hate Americans. Like, uh, even if you listen to Pakistani officials, uh, they, they are really not satisfied with, with uh, the US performance vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. And contrary, they are really enthusiastic vis-a-vis -vis China. And from my external perspective, uh, well, I do not know the reason of that. I also review some PhD theses of Pakistani students. And in this thesis, they express how they like China and dislike, or even more, uh, the U.S. So it's really interesting to know how, how why, why is it so? Because like the performance, so we've got like um, cli uh, like similar hierarchical relationship between Pakistan and China and Pakistan and the U.S. Uh, Patron-client relationships, I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Christian or Celine, any, yes. any actions? Yes, uh, Tino, thank you very much for the wonderful um, um, comments. Um, there are a couple of points, I mean, we can discuss it also in some other event. Of course, the idea of regionalism, and this is, and this is the struggle which I have, because there, is, there are very different concepts and ideas of what a region is, depending on the different disciplines, okay? So this is the main problem in the whole argument. For instance, your first point, that there is a sense of, of cooperation with the neighbors. Of course, that's, that's not the point. India has always had bilateral relations. But the idea is, is it, is it regionalism? So this is my task, which I have to do to make clear 
what I really do understand, so I would say, of course, there has always been bi bilateral um, um, relations and trade and uh, political relations. That's, that's not the point. But the idea of, let's say, a closer form of political cooperation slash organizational or institutional structure, this has rather, it's not very, has not been very much prominent uh, in these things. But uh, this is a common problem that, that I face. Um, so I see, I see your point and I um, will follow. Yes, I mean, we can have a long debate in how far um, this is going to be um, a development when you um, go back, when you find it in your archives in some 30 years, you may have a better view um, in how far some of these developments um, have set in or, or, or not. On your, on your last point, uh, connectivity without regionalism, um, I have not mentioned, which is also an interesting development, that it's not only connectivity, let's say, within the landmass of South Asia, it's also con connectivity on its borders, okay? So um, one could also have, or one could also make the point, maybe um, the, the Asia of the future is no longer shaped by our traditional understanding of regional organizations, like ASEAN, SEO, um, uh, ECO, uh, what have you, uh, but more by connectivity projects. You have, on the other side, uh, uh, to, the, to the east of India, you have ASEAN with different uh, connectivity projects. West of India, you have the International uh, North-South Transport Corridor. So in that sense, I think, yes, um, this could be a point. I, I, I would not call it chaotic. That's not the point. It's just different. And the question is, does it undermine the idea of a region or the common understanding what a region should be? Uh, on your point on India, China, of course, you're right. And But uh, again, I would say from the policy pers perspective, you're right. Uh, of course, now, the more the Chinese will enter into South Asia, the neighboring countries will also have a very steep learning curve that China is not all about honeymoon, okay? So this is why it's quite clear they will also use now the Indians to uh, balance against China, yes. But that's not my point. My point is, what's the impact, or is there an impact on the idea of a region, okay? So I would not, I think we would not have a difference on the argument, because of course the smaller countries will use the Indians, yes, but that's not that's not that's not part of my argument. Because my argument be, hmm, what's the impact on on the region or the understanding that there is a common region? Because what you were referring to would end up to a form of different bilateralisms, which may under or which somehow loosen or weaken the idea of a region. Okay, but that's an ongoing debate. We will have more opportunities in the future to discuss these issues also from policy perspective. So thank you very, very much for your comments so far. Thank you, Christian. Um, Celine, any reactions from you? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the comments. Uh, I will try my best to answer to those comments. As I told you, uh, I'm a research associate of CIRAPS, uh, the, the French University of Lille. Uh, I got a PhD in political science, uh, but I'm also a constructivist scholar. Uh, so maybe that's the difference with you, maybe I don't know, but uh, um, I would believe that, you know, in most of the great epics, you know, even in the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, for the, the Greek traditions, let's think about re the Ned Libo, for example, Ned Libo's uh, papers uh, on, you know, the, qu the quest for glory and credibility uh, of so many, uh, you know, contemporary leaders. I don't think about Barack Obama and the way he used, uh, you know, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, uh, keywords such as credibility, honor, and even glory uh, during the war uh, in Iraq. Uh, you know, the way uh, when the US, uh, they have been, you know, they were involved in the war on terror, uh, against, uh, you know, uh, all those Islamist groups, huh? they were also using uh, all those uh, 
you know, uh, ancient uh, epics. Huh? Uh, it influenced uh, the cognitive mindset of those political leaders. Uh, so I tried. Uh, yes, this is the very initial paper, you know, very draft paper, sorry, at a very initial stage. So I'm, I understand on the point of view, uh, and this is a very good comment because I, I need to uh, give a few more examples and precise examples um, to, to make this paper, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, intelligible, huh? more clear. Uh, but the story of the Ramayana can be seen in this line. The Ramayana has been integrated, incorporated by many people, huh? uh, you know, the, the ordinary people, uh, even in the school, uh, or through movies, but also political leaders. And let's see uh, the way the BJP and even the, the Congress party, they have been competing uh, on uh, the Ramayana. Uh, you know, that notion of grand narrative uh, is used by the BJP to fight against, you know, the Congress party, uh, which is perceived as uh, not really, you know, uh, defending the interest of India. And um, this is very interesting. Yes, maybe I should also compare with Cambodia and Thailand uh, and maybe uh, several other countries um, in Southeast Asia. But the way India and the role played by India uh, in, uh, you know, in the domestic sphere and in the region and towards the rest of the world, it is also highly, uh, you know, you, we can see that in the figure uh, or in the threats of um, the, way Ma the way Narendra Modi has been interacting with others. He is depicted as the Lord Rama, you know, uh, in several uh, campaigns. Uh, you know, th so there is a whole imaginary, imaginary sorry, uh, based on this type of myth, um, and uh, the, those uh, people, they are also building or rebuilding, uh, you know, political debates, uh, and they also uh, they have to face uh, some some of those constraints. Um, but using the Ramayana is, you know, um, such as Constantino Xavier said about the good and bad norms. They, they, it is an ethical debate and there's no good or bad norms. Uh, you know, this is, this is depending on the way you are taking, you know, your stance, you know, the way you take um, your position. Uh, but here, uh, the way those discourses, speeches, uh, behaviors adopted by Modi and the BJP, uh, we have to see that, uh, you know, uh, in, in a configuration, you know, where the Congress party tries to reclaim uh, some uh, some seats huh, in the parliament, in the Lok Sabha, in the Raj Sabha, uh, etc. So that's why uh, these, are, these are my basic comments for now uh, for the question, uh, you know, for, the, for your comments. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for all the, the constructive, I think, uh, acknowledgement both ways there about the um, different papers. <laughs> We're now going to have the Q&A. Um, first of all, we're going to have a question from um, Anrita, who I know has to leave quite soon. So we'll just have her question on her own. And then after that, we'll group some questions together. Um, Anrita, go for it. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm sorry to jump the queue. I have to rush off. That was so interesting. Um, I have a question. Actually, I have a, a, a question and a suggestion for Christian. And then I really enjoyed listening to the presentation on the on the on the on the on the Ramayana and impact on Modi and I would love to have a look at the paper at some point if that's possible as you know I've done work on the Mahabharata and yes. its impact on Indian politics and I would be super interested in here in reading what you've written so maybe we could connect at some point thank you thank you okay so so Christian I really found your paper so fascinating I have um, a question and a comment. So the, quest, the question is, I'm wondering if you're underestimating the impact that COVID is having on South Asian regionalism in two ways, at least two ways, right? And, I, so the, there are two, and the two mechanisms that I see. One is the discrediting of the BRI because of increasing suspicion about China, right? So. BRI ceases to be as great a threat as it used to be. That would be one suggestion on how I see that mechanism playing out. The other one would be, and this is an empirical question, it would be really interesting to see how far in public debate, in policy debate, in may, perhaps in media, 
there is an anti-China reaction in South Asia. Are we seeing an othering of China? And in that sense, we could get a really interesting reinforcement of a South Asian identity. Uh, so quite, this was sort of question slash comment and then a suggestion. Because I'm involved a little bit with people from the World Economic Forums. I go to some of their meetings. And the business community, of course, looks at the questions we're looking at in a very different way. And, and one of the big differences is they are really talking about business connectivity of South Asia, right? And, to wit, and so I ask them a different kind of a question. And I say to them, I don't really believe it, what you're telling me here, because you are all so deeply um, caught up in those chains of weaponized interdependence with China. So I don't really believe it when you tell me that you can have an alternative. But from your perspective, it might be really useful to speak to the business community and see whether there are any synergies that are emerging between um, the political identity and the business um, interests that are helping shape that in the context of South Asian regionalism. Thanks. Um, go for your response, Christian, I think, because I'm ready to need to yes, leave. Yes, as so. <laughs> I'm going to leave, let, let me just give a quick response. Thank you very much for the wonderful um, question, comments. Two points. First, um, we are just doing a small project here to compare COVID supplies from India and China to South Asia. And you can guess what the result is. Okay? Of course, the Chinese are supplying more. Okay, so in that sense, hmm, I think yes, I I see the point. I've also saw the debate on the revitalization of side during the COVID crisis. Of course, I would share, and Tino made a similar point that there is um, a, a rethinking on China. Yes, of course, but the question is, and this is would be my a similar answer to what I gave to to Tino. I, I would see a situation where India will be used as a balancer against China, just as China has been used as a balancer against, against India in former times. But I do not see, or there I'm skeptical, I do not see where there is the link to regionalism. Okay, so I would see we will have different forms of bilateral relations, by, but different forms of bilateral relations, I do not see how they make uh, regionalism. Okay, so this is why I mean we can continue the debate on on the business community. Hmm. I have a couple of books here who have talked about regional co of economic regional cooperation in this part of the world for years and decades. We all know the outcome of intra-regional trade and all these nice projects which have been put up. I'm not sure in how far this new debate and the new debate that India should would benefit from the, the from the chain from the from companies moving out of China. India would benefit. It's more that other countries do benefit. So I'm not really sure. It could be the case that the business community may see new opportunities. Yes, but giving the giving the connectivity situation in the region. Maybe it would be slightly better, but I think I do not really see the great economic hope in this as the situation has become difficult. And as China is becoming the economically the more attractive partner for most of the South Asian countries. Yeah? So this is why I'm, I'm not really sure or one has probably to see which part of business would benefit from certain certain policies, but I do not see that the business community would be really be able to be the game changer for stronger regionalism, because that's a debate which is there in the region since many years and has not really brought a lot of results, at least so, so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we've got a few other questions from different people. Uh, we can group them together, uh, maybe three at a time. So. Uh, first of all, Kate, uh, then Nico, and then Robert. Um, Kate? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, I just had a, I guess, a comment for each of the, the first few papers that, that hopefully might be useful for thinking through the research agendas. Um, and then uh, a, a question for Christian's paper. 
So, um, Agnieszka, I, I really like, as, as uh, Tino said, the fact that you are engaging critically with the concept of soft power. And um, I think you point out rightly its limitations, um, its sort of ethnocentrism, um, and the fact that we need to, to think that through more critically. But again, just to sort of, again, a call for more disruptiveness, which is going to probably be my, my theme in this conference, um, you are making an assumption, I think, first, that soft power works, and secondly, that soft power is a useful category of analysis. And I just want to sort of make two reading recommendations on those two points, which um, I personally have found useful, and, and maybe you will too. The first one is um, Ian Hall and Frank Smith have a great article in Asian Security in 2013. Um, and in that piece, they really look, they try through a range of qualitative and quantitative measures, they try to work out whether soft power works. Um, and they look at both India and China. And they come to the conclusion that there is little, if any, positive correlation um, between public diplomacy by Asian states and foreign public opinion. And in fact, they've got this delicious graph where Chinese expenditure on soft power initiative goes up and public opinion about China goes down literally, <laughs> you know, over the same period of time. So it, it would be worth looking at that, uh, that paper, I think, you know, even sort of, that you could draw in some questions about soft power at the, at the very beginning of your analysis. The other piece that might be worth looking at is a piece by Todd Hall. There's lots of Halls, I know. Um, uh, and this one is called, uh, I've forgotten now, I'll have to put it in the chat. This is Todd's piece on, um, really there's a critique of soft power. He, and he critiques it by really making a distinction between uh, a category of, uh, of analysis, which is a kind of very social science, uh, experience distant category through which um, we undertake social analysis, and um, a, a category of practice. And the categories of practice for him are kind of like folk theories. They're ways in which um, practitioners, uh, regular lay people make sense of a particular phenomenon. And his argument is that soft power, it's not actually something that is analytically useful. Um, so I, I would kind of encourage you to sort of really push, push sort of forward on this critique of soft power. Think about whether it's what you really want to use. Um, and it might sort of encourage you to break down, I think, your paper into some different empirical um, sort of clusters, because you've got a lot going on in it. You're doing the kind of the very holistic kind of um, uh, sort of Gründlichkeit, I don't know how you say that in, 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 in English, but this kind of thoroughness by covering everything. Um, but do you, is, is that to the benefit of an in-depth kind of analysis on one, two, three points that might allow you to draw out some more nuanced um, and, and, and sort of more, more commanding um, sort of conclusions? So, um, yeah, I, I, just a, a couple of provocations there. Um, if I could comment on Celine's paper, um, I think I see what you're getting at, Celine, and it, I think it's a really interesting thing to do to think about the way that these big kind of texts uh, shape the way that actors um, you know, operate. Let's put it like that. Um, but again, there's two points that I would sort of encourage you to think through. So the first one um, is really, if we think about where these kinds of cultural analyses of foreign policy behavior come from, um, from my understanding, we're really looking at a debate on strategic culture that opens up in the 1970s, right? In the 1970s, people are getting a bit tired of, of realism. They're starting to realize that you've got kind of powers or countries with kind of reasonably similar material uh, capabilities, but they're behaving in different ways. And so the way that was strategic culture specialists decided to sort of work out what the kind of um, differences were, the cultures were that shaped these different behavioral outcomes. Now, one of the problems is because IR scholars of that, that period were not, you know, anthropologists, um, you ended up with a, a really kind of worrying set of very reductive portraits of particular national cultures, uh, reifications of culture that portray particular national cultures as very static, very homogenous, you know, unchanging throughout time, and almost kind of impermeably sealed from any other cultural influence. 
Um, and hopefully we've moved on since, since that time. Um, but if you want to read a really good example of this for India, I mean, George Tannum's 1992 RAND survey called Indian Strategic Thought and Interpretive Essay, which is a very generous title, um, really is quite appalling in the way that it essentializes Indians, right? So he, he talks about Indians being irrational and fatalistic and oh, it's just like, cringeworthy. So I think the question is, you know, really, it's interesting to map out kinds of worldviews from these big te texts, but what we need is empirical evidence um, of how they shape the ways that actors think um, and behave, or perhaps just the latter, but I'll come to that point in a moment. And you rightly point out that Ned LeBeau has, has done some really interesting work drawing on Greek ethics and so on, um, but he has very rich <coughs> engagement that shows how those epics and how that thinking uh, impacts the behavior of states. So a good model for the empirical richness. But let me come to my second point, and this is kind of Robert Jervis's um, endogeneity problem. So we as social scientists need to theorize about the way actors theorize their own behavior. And it's actually an impossible thing to do. We can never get access to the way an actor is theorizing their own behavior. That means the way that they're making sense of it, the way they're, um, you know, uh, working on the basis of their own assumptions about the world. And you could argue you could try and do it with, with interviews, but, you know, you're probably not going to get an interview with Modi. So what would be a safe uh, methodological approach? And I wonder if, if it might be interesting to think about the performance or the performativity of, of um, the use of, of sacred Hindu texts. So if we see a, pr a, a, a kind of, um, you know, higher instance of references to the Ramayana or, or, or of gift, diplomatic gift giving or any other kind of behavioral markers that we can actually empirically observe, why might they be being deployed? What is it that, that Modi, for example, might be wanting to achieve through that? And I think, you know, there's some really interesting answers that have to do with his outreach, that have to do with his kind of stronger emphasis on the use of culture in, in or the, the emphasis on culture in India's uh, foreign policy. And of course, we mustn't forget the, the domestic audience that, that Modi has very carefully cultivated. And I think in Ian Hall's book, the book shows that really well as well. So I'd be wanting to think more about what the Ramayana is doing kind of symbolically rather than whether it's shaping how Modi behaves. But that's just a suggestion. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say uh, is that I thought that you dealt with the interrogation of your credentials with extreme patience, respect and calm. And I don't know if I could have done that myself. Um, finally, Christian, I, I sort of to kind of draw on the, 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 the question that you asked uh, to Tobias and Caroline yesterday is, is how you're measuring change um, in the... In, in the shifts in the region, because I've just finished a paper with Rajesh Basrur, and um, you know, within SAFTA, we see that India's exports to South Asia have tripled in the last 10 years from 9.9 .9 billion to 30 billion. Um, South Asian countries' trade back to India has doubled from two to four billion. So there is some kind of growth in the way that this kind of uh, economic or trade based regional integration is, is moving. Extra regional trade leakage has always been an issue in South Asia. So I'm just, you know, to push sort of yesterday's question back to you. Um, yeah, what, what, how, how, is there any kind of data that you're building on? And also, how do you deal with, I think, the really interesting phenomenon that we have at the moment of, of Modi really trying to project that the region is disintegrating and that Pakistan is an outsider because that's a political project that he's leading. And I wonder if it's influencing perhaps media um, reporting or, or the ways in which uh, people like us are making sense of the region. So thanks very much. Yeah, very, very good, thank you. Um, Hannah's your question and then uh, Robert's as well and then we can get some collective responses. Hannah's, you're very quiet. We can't yeah, hear you. We can't hear you, Hannes. You have something wrong with the mic. Um, okay. 
Um, Robert, if you could give your question and then I'll read out Hannah's question when he sends it in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone from Delhi. Uh, my uh, very, very interesting papers. Um, thank you so much, Celine and uh, Professor Wagner. My first question would be for Celine. Uh, I wanted to know if there is a specific relation between uh, the ideological foundations of a particular political party or a particular leader and uh, these mythological influences that you're talking about. What kind of parties or what kind of you know, leaders tend to be easily influenced by these uh, mythological influences or mythological uh, texts as we know of? And um, would it be also accurate to say that these are some sort of a political method to or used by leaders to, to, to create a narrative of greatness for political gains and perhaps to feed populism. I mean, what, what is the purpose of all of this at the end of the day is, uh, you know, what I would like to ask you. And uh, Professor Wagner, uh, you mentioned China being politically more attractive than India. Uh, how do we define this political attractiveness? Does it in any way have to do with the rise of religious nationalism in India? And, uh, you know, so that's basically what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's get responses to those two questions, if we could. Um, anyone can start, Christian, Agnieszka, Celine, go for it. Um, okay, thank you very much um, for all of your comments and remarks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kate. Uh, first, your comments were very in instructive, very constructive ones, uh, very in interesting, and I'm, I guess that I'm going to include those comments uh, in my papers because, as I told you, uh, I, I apologize for that, but it was a, a very uh, draft paper at a very initial uh, stage. Um, but I found that the subject was quite interesting. Uh, yes, I read a lot about, you know, uh, uh, about the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and the way, you know, some scholars used, uh, you know, in order to understand uh, behaviors, attitudes, speeches of political leaders. So I, I wanted to focus on Naimra Modi and I'm going to, to do that in a more detailed uh, way, yes, in depth. Um, and thank you, a lot. thanks a lot also, Amrita. Uh, for your comments, uh, but I'm going to start uh, with the comments made by uh, Kate, and then maybe I uh, will try my best to answer to the questions uh, or remarks uh, made by Robert. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's start with, uh, you know, the way, uh, yes, uh, I do not have, you know, very precise uh, answers. I fully understand uh, Kate's uh, remarks. Uh, you know, I didn't want to um, to make a very reductive portrait or to stuck to be stuck in the 1970s or something like that. Um, so I understood on the way you uh, you know you shared your your, your remarks. Um, so I'm going to multiply maybe uh, the empirical uh, data on the examples uh, in order to prove that Narendra Modi maybe can be influenced, not only him, uh, but also the whole BJP uh, and, you know, alongside, you know, um, you know they, they also, they have been influenced by the RS, RSS, sorry, uh, the way they have been influenced by those great epics, uh, not only, you know, in order to be, you know, in stuck in, to be stuck in the, uh, you know, dream world or, you know, uh, uh, or to demonize, only to demonize other minorities or communities. Huh? I don't want to, you know, to make this kind of relative portraits. Uh, but I guess that, you know, uh, the way, uh, you know, those epics have influenced, uh, you know, uh, the cognitive mindset, the cognitive or mental map of those leaders can be, uh, once again, very interesting. Yeah? Even uh, Brent Steele uh, has made, you know, some uh, work on, you know, the way honor, uh, you know, honor, you know, the quest for honor, the quest for glory uh, can be viewed as an extension, extension of individual pride. Uh, in this case, uh, there's a fight, you know, there's a campaign uh, led, conducted by the BJP in order to fight against uh, the Congress party because 
even nowadays, huh, Rahul Gandhi, uh, the son of uh, you know Rajiv Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi, and the grandson of Indira Gandhi, uh, etc. He is depicted, described as you know the Lord Rama. You know here here you have a whole campaign, political campaign. Uh, you know, uh, since the, the years um, 2015-2016, uh, where the BJP tries to be depicted, you know, as, you know, nurturing, you know, uh, uh, as trying to defend India's interest against uh, the Chinese ones, against, you know, some alien interest huh, in, in the country, uh, against uh, the country's interest. Uh, you have also, you know, the, the willingness of uh, those BJP leaders, and especially Narendra Modi, huh, trying to be depicted as, you know, um, a kind of, um, it is not really the, the correct word, but, you know, he, he's really uh, trying to depict, to depict himself, to describe himself as a messianic uh, figure, you know, uh, trying to save uh, India uh, in that, you know, um, ocean of, uh, you know, alien forces, uh, etc. So this is a starting point, and um, let's continue on with uh, trying to gather, you know, more empirical data uh, in order to uh, to nurture uh, the theoretical uh, thoughts here. But thank you very much for your references and for your comments. Uh, I will surely, for sure, uh, I will definitely um, get all those comments, uh, include all those comments, and try to uh, to nurture my my thoughts about. Uh, the way the Ramayana, the Ramayana has influenced the grand narrative uh, strategy uh, by Modi and the BJP. Um, thank you also for your comments, uh, Robert, uh, your, com your questions. Uh, but I'm not sure that I, uh, I clearly understood your first question. Can you uh, just maybe, can you repeat your first question? I don't know if I get uh, everything, Robert. I don't know if he's here. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. uh, I'll keep the video off so that I think the you know yes. that it could be better. What I asked was, uh, what kind of political parties tend to be easily influenced by mythological influences? Like, uh, what what type of political parties or leaders tend to have this kind of uh, you know uh, this this kind of connection with mythology or mythological influences in trying to sort of maybe win an election or or chart out their policies or chart out their ideologies. Like you've talked about India, you've also talked about uh, cases in uh, somewhere in uh, Eastern uh, Asia as well, Indonesia perhaps, right? So is there a trend that have emerged in what type of parties are they? And basically that's what I wanted to know. And the later one you heard. Yes, uh, for sure. So thank you very much, Robert. And I'm going to quickly answer uh, to those questions. Um, I will try my best to do that. Uh, you know, what kind of political parties or leaders uh, were uh, maybe more, uh, you know, uh, on, the, on the verge to be influenced or to be uh, connected to the myths? I guess, yeah, for sure, because I did my PhD thesis uh, on the way, you know, the Indian political leaders tried to influence uh, the Sri Lankan civil conflict. Uh, you know, I have Sri Lankan Tamil origins. And I was very, very, very interested by the way you know, those uh, Indian leaders, they uh, tried on the best uh, to arbiter uh, some of you know, uh, the, the, the main um, conflicts and domestic conflicts between the LTT, the Tamil Tigers, uh, and the Sri Lankan government, or other uh, boys, you know, uh, other rebel groups, uh, and their relationship to uh, the Sri Lankan government. Uh, but here, in this case, uh, we can see uh, in a very uh, clear way for those who have studied or analyzed uh, the evolution of uh, the Indian politics uh, since, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the post-independence since 1947, uh, 1948. Here in this case, uh, we can see, yes, uh, the, the Ramayana, you know, the way uh, it has been in, uh, used huh? um, was not that clear uh, in the past years, but under uh, Narendra Modi, under the BJP, there's a clear, you know, strong signal sent to uh, the opposition parties, sent to uh, the Indians, huh? uh, that you know there's a need uh, to uh, to embrace to 
to you know to comprehend uh, India's uh, history, you know in India's glorious past, glorious myth. And you you were right from the beginning when you said that maybe it maybe it was nurturing populism. So maybe this is one part. You know this is a part of the 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 the, the answer. Uh, but the BJP you know, has constructed itself on that basis, you know, uh, trying to uh, to comprehend uh, India's whole, you know, the, the whole history, the past, the glorious past, etc. The Congress Party for several years uh, with Nehru or, you know, uh, Indira Gandhi or even Rajiv Gandhi and, you know, uh, all the other uh, leaders, they have not used the Ramayana this way. But here in this case, uh, in India, uh, we can see that. Huh? Uh, so some populist parties or some very nationalist parties can use, uh, you know, the Ramayana in order to be, uh, you know, um, in order to 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 make, uh, you know, to to to, to send strong signals uh, to their audience, uh, to the electorate. Uh, and the same huh, we can see also in Cambodia in the 1970s, huh, uh, when the Khmer used also some of the great grand uh, characteristics of the Ramayana in order to, uh, you know, to to mix huh, with their, uh, their ideology. So in order, once again, to create a new, you know, a new Cambodia. So once again, we can make another paper on that, you know, the conversion between, uh, you know, the, the way Ramayana has been used by all those Southeast Asian countries, uh, but this is not the purpose of my paper. So for now, I do not have any precise, uh, you know, precise information, precise answers uh, uh, for your second question, uh, Robert. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for your que questions. I guess thank that you. it's okay for now. Thank you for your response. Um, Christine and Agnes, too, if you could reply relatively quickly, just so we can have a little break before the next panel, that would be super appreciated. Um, Christian? Are you in here? Uh, yes, thank Can you hear me? Yes, you should hear me. Wait, I just had my questions um, deleted. Um, thank you very much, Kate, for the question. Um, my advantage is that I do not follow in the paper um, a stringent theoretical approach, which is, which is also a weakness. I take the point. Uh, because I also looked at the trade figures and um, the latest figure I found on intra-regional trade in South Asia was five to six percent. Then I took the effort to go back to the mid 80s to see what was intra-regional trade um, in the region when SAIC was established and it was two to three percent. So you, I could make the point saying, hey, intra-regional trade has increased by a hundred percent. I'm not really sure whether that's a good indicator for success because the figure is still low. Uh, so in that sense, and my second problem, which I may hope to make clear is that the idea of South Asia has, as I said, a very different meaning. So um, it's the most easiest in our debate in political science when we discuss about uh, regionalism, then you, then you can make the argument probably stronger. I know that India has also intensified trade with the region that's that's not the point Be, or yes that's of that's of course positive but let's say the intra-regional trade is still on a relatively modest level and especially china is catching up or has surpassed india in some of the countries so this is why i think yes um it's difficult to measure to measure change yes but my my approach is not to have a clear concept as i said it's a these are developments in, in very different disciplines and on very diff, uh, different levels uh, where I would just bring in the point that we may see a change. It's not going to be to happen very soon, but it, it may have um, the impact to change our understanding uh, on this part of the world. Robert, why is China politically more attractive? The reason why I made the point is quite simple. Uh, when the Chinese came or when the smaller countries used China to balance India, the smaller countries never had the same kind of bilateral problems that they had with India, okay? So even if they had problems with China, China was just a distant uh, distant country, uh, but I mean, none of the South Asian countries really uh, has this kind of minority uh, 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 conflict um, or what whatever term you may use. Um, 
with China than they have with India in different forms. So this is why the Chinese have the advantage. They bring a lot of money, yes, and they are politically not such a contentious domestic issue in the South Asian countries compared to uh, India. Thank you. I, I also have a question for Agnes. This is okay. why I raised my hand. Um, if you could ask super quickly because we've yes, kind of really run Agnes, out of time. Agnes, thanks for the paper. Just three short points. First, when I talk to when I've talked to Pakistani friends, they all tell me it's a cultural clash with the Chinese. Pig eating Chinese in Pakistani culture, a nightmare. Okay? Which raised the the point, what about the, the reaction of religious parties uh, towards this heavy Chinese investment in how far the Chinese are also trying to woo at least the religious party? Second, what about the role of the army? Does the army benefit from the soft power offensive you see? Last point, um, you, you may be aware, but you haven't mentioned it. I found it quite interesting. Some provincial gov governments try to introduce Mandarin in their school curricula. Okay? I know it from the, uh, there was some reports from the Sindh government. So it would be an, an interesting point, which you may add to see in how far Chinese in, or soft power is trickling down in Pakistani society. Thank you. Um, Aki, is a, uh, thank you, Kate and Christians for, uh, for your comments. Uh, at first, referring to to, uh, to Kate, so uh, thank you for recommending me these readings. Like the literature uh, about soft power uh, is huge, so sometimes it's hard to distinguish like the most uh, valuable readings. And once again, the number of cases has to be limited uh, in my uh, paper. Uh, now uh, le let's move to Christian's uh, comments. Well, cultural clash, of course, uh, it exists, but according to my uh, brief observations that I met, made uh, at the U University of the Punjab in Lahore uh, in Islamabad visiting NGOs, uh, there is like, I have not recognized such uh, uh, clashes. Uh, even in Islamabad, there are like Chinese girls wearing miniskirts um, which also can can cause some clashes uh, because uh, Pakistani society is like is, is, is conservative and um, like Westerners visiting uh, Pakistan do not dare uh, to to wear miniskirts or shorts, but Chinese are allowed uh, to do so. Uh, so maybe I, sh I should look at a diet. You know, <laughs> maybe that that's a different. Uh, case when it comes to the role um, of the army, well, the, the development of the CPAC um, has um, elevated the status of Pakistani army because it's the main security provider for for the infrastructure. So, like, I would say that they do not care about like discussion about soft power and soft power influences uh, because uh, now they've got like even more power uh, than the, they used to have, despite the fact that uh, the imbalance of control between security and civil establishment is something that, that, that uh, shapes internal political dynamics in, in Pakistan since, since, uh, since um, uh, early uh, 50s, uh, at least. And uh, thank you for uh, for reminding me about like uh, the, the 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 case of uh, uh, Mandarinian language classes in schools. Uh, I will have to uh, investigate that uh, profoundly. So so thanks uh, for that again. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're going to have to end the panel there. I'm very aware that other people had questions. Hannah had a question. Tobias Berger had a question. Zvesh had a question. Uh, Christine, you got in your question. Um, I think if you can follow up through the chat or follow up personally with people through email, I think that would be a good solution. Um, we're going to have a short break now for five minutes before the next panel, um, and that will be chaired by Raphael Khan. But thank you very much. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much to all the presenters. Thank you for our discussants. Um, Tina has left, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. And thank you for a very interesting and thought-provoking session. Thank you.